Good morning, all. And so, first of all, actually, before I start, I want to uh, thank ISOC, Kevin, Aftab, and all ISOC staff for giving us the opportunity to present here uh, at ION Islamabad. So, uh, my presentation is going to focus on the DNS sec, uh, but obviously, um, I'll be covering. Uh, some some of the uh, high level conceptual uh, contents i won't be going into very detailed stuff because of the uh, uh, time availability but in case if anyone is interested in going into more details in in especially the configuration related things later on in sanog uh, workshops we are going to conduct a workshop there so you can uh, participate in that uh, okay now in case if any one of you are new to DNS, I mean, before we talk about DNSSEC, if any one of you are new to DNS, uh, I just want to give a quick recap, uh, you know, about DNS and, and what are we talking about, and then go into DNSSEC, right? Uh, so in, in DNS, uh, simply, uh, this is how the resolution process. Uh, there are different types of DNS servers, for example, um, we have things called resolvers or recursive servers that um, do the DNS uh, queries and go and ask questions from various other DNS servers. For example, from root servers uh, and then from authoritative servers and so on. Right? So in this diagram, uh, you, will, you see a client there. So this client, you know, can be uh, even a stub resolver, for example. You know, it could be your device, uh, or it could be, uh, say, for example, if you are browsing, if you are sending an email. You know, that's that's what we are talking about here, right? The client, and then uh, so the client could be sending a request to the resolver. Now, typically, the resolver could be your ISP's resolver. Uh, if the ISP is providing the connectivity for you, uh, if you're in a corporate environment, uh, your organization could be uh, providing this service as well. Uh, so that's basically the recursive server or the resolver. So the client would send a request to the uh, resolver or the recursive server. And then, uh, say for example, in this case, uh, the client is asking for www.example.net. Right? So that's a domain name, and uh, simply it's a web server that we're asking for. Uh, but if the client has to visit the web server and download the web page, client has to know the IP address of the web server. Right. So the question here is, we need the IP address of www.example.net. So how can we find the IP address? Uh, we have now sent that request to our recursive server, which is now supposed to give us that IP address. So the recursive server will go and talk to, uh, first of all, the root servers. Because why it's going to contact root servers in the DNS hierarchy? Root is in the top, right? That's the top of the hierarchy, the root. So we have, uh, there are, I mean, root is, actually you can call it as a root zone here. So root zone is the database itself, the root database. So where do we have this root database? In different uh, servers called root servers. So there are number of root servers scattered around the world that keeps this root database or the root zone. So our resolver, the recursive server, would go and talk to uh, any of these root servers, uh, the optimal one and then get an answer uh, so that the recursive server can go to the next level, which is, in this case, .NET. Because after the root, the TLD level is .NET, because we are looking for www.example.net. Uh, so the query would go to uh, .NET name server. So these type of name servers are called authoritative name servers. Uh, these terms are also quite important when you try to understand, uh, especially when, you, when we go into DNSSEC, uh, because uh, there are two aspects of DNSSEC as well. One is the DNSSEC validation, and the other thing is the DNSSEC signing. So 
uh, we do the signing at the authoritative server level, whereas we do the validations at the recursive server level. So recursive server, that is what we have in the middle uh, that goes and talk to these other servers like root servers or the authoritative servers. So .NET server would respond back to the resolver, the recursive server, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the reference to the next level. So in this case, it is the authoritative server of example.NET. So that's how uh, the recursive server would go and talk to different levels of uh, name servers and then find the answer, appropriate answer, which is the IP address, and that that IP address is given to the client. So once the client gets the IP address, now client has got the IP address uh, of the web server, so the client can now directly establish a connection. Client can go to the web server and download the web page. That's how uh, a simple DNS query works, whether even when you send an email, when you try to access uh, a website, same thing happens. So in this process, um, next step is now, here we are not talking anything about security, right? So it's just a simple DNS query. Now, where, you know, when this query happens, what are the threats involved? Where, where you know, we can go wrong, or where someone can actually get some uh, advantage and, and create some uh, situation where we encounter some threat or some vulnerability here. So one is um, the cache poisoning, which is quite common, right? So in cache poisoning, if you remember that previous diagram, the server which was in the middle, the recursive server. So recursive server goes to root servers, the TLD.NET servers, next level servers, and so on, and get the answer once it gets that IP address. And after giving that IP address to the client, it keeps that IP address in its memory or in the cache. So that when another client asks for the same question, say another client asks for give me www.example.net, then the recursive server does not have to go through the same process again, through .NET, example, and so on. The recursive server can straight away give that answer to the client from its cache, right? So it will, you know, of course, it, it will be a better response time, uh, uh, and, and the cl client will get the answer quickly. So this is how uh, the caching works. But the problem is, if someone managed to poison that cache, if I keep the IP address saying, say, 1.2.3.4, uh, that's in my memory, in my cache, but if someone managed to change that to something else, then when the client come and ask a question from me, I would respond with the wrong or poisoned answer. So that poisoned answer could be directing to a fake website or a wrong website, right? So then the client will end up in going and talking uh, to a wrong website. So this is, you know, cache poisoning. Uh, and and uh, so this is where we need to be careful. And then sometimes even someone can uh, even le you know legitimately buy some domain name, and then they can create also a website, and then uh, they can give authoritative responses for that uh, site what they have created. So when they give the authoritative response for that site, uh, also they can give some additional responses to uh, other places. Say, for example, in this case, uh, they could give some response to uh, something related to eBay, right? So IP address related to the eBay. You know, in this case, uh, the client might, uh, or the resolver might keep that answer in the cache and then go and when a client asks for, say, uh, a different website, they can give that answer back to the client so that the client will visit a wrong place. So this is uh, the cache poisoning, which is kind of a threat. Um, another threat would be uh, some DNS hijackings. These, these are also quite common, can happen in various ways. Uh, but general idea is that uh, you are being uh, you are being given you are being taken into wrong places. So uh, one example is that nowadays, uh, say for example, you know if we if we connect to uh, various Wi-Fi access points, you now when you see many of these access points, you know say you'll find a free uh, hotspot you might connect. Uh, to that AP, right? So which means if you connect to that AP, uh, you are pretty much using someone else's infrastructure uh, and, and you have to rely on that. You trust that, right? So uh, if you are trusting, say, some recursive server, which is unknown to you, uh, that recursive server can actually, that means you are trusting the answers uh, 
uh, that are given by that recursive server, right? So even say, just like in our ISP's case, when we connect to our ISP network, uh, we trust the ISP's recursive server. So we use our ISP's recursive server to go and find all those websites. Um, in the same way, yeah, if, if, uh, if someone can actually um, uh, let us connect to their network, maybe through an AAP or maybe through some other way of hijacking, uh, they can always give some wrong responses. They can redirect us to their recursive servers that they maintain. Uh, or this can be done even through malware, for example, because uh, they can direct you to a malware site, and then the malware can be downloaded into your device. So malware can even change your DNS setting. If the malware can change your DNS settings, say now you have a certain DNS uh, resolver configured in your device, if the malware can change that to something else, that means you are using uh, that uh, resolver to go and find different websites and, and so on. So these are all different ways that the DNS hijacking can happen. So these are some threats that are uh, commonly involved. So this is where we have to think about DNSSEC, right? Uh, so if I'm going to visit my bank website, and when I go to my bank, how do I really know whether it is really my bank website? It might really look like the same. Right, phishing sites. It might look the same, but how do I really know that it is really my bank website? So this is where we can do validations to check whether are we really going to the right place? Is it the right IP address that we are going? Right. So that's where DNSSEC can be used or involved. Now, generally, if you see the data flow in DNS, now um, we have zone files. So zone files simply they are databases, right? They are databases where you would uh, have all these mappings between your resource records, say for example name to number mappings and so on. So these are your zone files or the uh, DNS databases. So these files exist in your primary name servers. And then um, primary name server is not just enough. In case if the primary server is down, you still have to have some uh, secondary servers. So that is where you will have in your DNS infrastructure, you will have your secondary DNS servers as well. Um, so you, when you update your zone files, the primary server and the secondary server has to be synchronized so that the zone file can get transferred to the secondary server so that in case if the client goes and talk to a secondary server, secondary server will also give the same information just like as the primary, right? So that is why we call these both primary and secondary name servers are as authoritative name servers, right? So authoritative name servers, which means they are authorized to give the reliable answers, primaries, secondaries, or you can even have multiple secondaries. So we have our primary name servers, secondary name servers, and then the caching name servers that we mentioned before, uh, or the recursive name servers, resolvers, it is all the same, same, same thing, right? So these caching name servers, when they want to find an answer, they would go and talk to these either primaries or secondaries uh, for the uh, data, the DNS data, right? And then the caching servers would uh, go and answer its uh, clients. So in this process, uh, there are many vulnerabilities involved. If you really think about what are the uh, risks and vulnerabilities in DNS, we can point so many. Actually, none of these places are secured enough. Uh, if someone wants to attack, they can attack anywhere in our DNS infrastructure. They can corrupt the zone files. Uh, they can, um, you know, uh, say the, our zone transfers, impersonate our primaries. Say, for example, if I'm the primary and if you are the uh, secondary, when you come to me and get my zone file, that's, we call, that, that's what we call the zone transfers. When you get my zone file, how do you know whether really I am your primary? Right. So that's, you know, someone else can impersonate me. Someone else can pretend to be me. Uh, so these are also some security uh, risks that we have in the DNS infrastructure. Uh, and then we also have things called dynamic updates. Dynamic DNS is another area. So that means our DNS database can be updated dynamically. So if there are some updates coming in, how do we know whether these updates are valid or correct? So, uh, and, and then also, as I mentioned before, there are cache poisoning issues and so on. So there are various risks and threats involved in DNS. 
But the question is, can we protect everything by DNSSEC? No, that, that we can't, right? DNSSEC is only one security mechanism where we can protect only the DNS data, right? So where DNSSEC fits in, uh, that is actually uh, related to things like man-in-the-middle attacks, things like uh, hijacking, DNS hijacking, or uh, cache poisoning. Things like zone transfers, we can't really uh, protect by DNSSEC because that's a transaction that is between servers. So we have to protect the channel for that, not really the data, right? So DNSSEC will be involved when it comes to the data protection, right? So what DNSSEC does and doesn't do, uh, say for example, if um, if there are some even threats like DDoS type thing, because DDoS, if there are some open resolvers, for example, remember the recursive name servers that we discussed before. Uh, so if you allow recursion to anyone, if you accept queries coming from uh, anyone, not only your clients, from anyone, uh, those are called open recursive servers, and they can be used uh, to create or, or uh, uh, to create DDoS type attacks. But then that cannot be protected by DNSSEC because you know that's not related to DNS data here, right? So DNSSEC doesn't provide things like DDoS or even keeping the DNS data private because DNS data is public. That's where the challenge is. That's where we have to use DNSSEC to make sure that we can validate uh, the, the correct DNS data, right? Because DNS data is public. Uh, Whereas where we can use DNSSEC, it is to uh, establish or ensure the legitimacy of data that is retrieved from DNS. That's where we use DNSSEC, right? Uh, so what we do is we do validations to make sure that uh, ensuring uh, the correctness of the data, what we can do is we can do the validation. So now I'm coming back to the same diagram that I showed you before. Right? Earlier, it was simple query, but now we will introduce validation into this. So how do we introduce validation, or how can we validate whether the data is correct? So this is where we can use the keys. Here we are talking about asymmetric keys. Now in asymmetric keys, um, we have key pairs. We have private keys, and we have public keys. Um, so when we have these key pairs, obviously as the name sound, private key has to be private. It is, you have to keep it safe. That is why we call it a private key. Whereas public key has to be for the public, right? So we have to publish that. So what we do is we create these keys and we publish our public key and then uh, we keep our private key safe. And also we can generate we can generate a signature using these. So now we will also have a signature, and signature also can be published. So what we do is we publish the signatures as well as we publish the public keys. So if anyone wants to validate our signatures, they can use our public keys and validate whether that signature is whether it's mine or not, correct or not. Right? So that's simply what we do in DNSSEC. So what are we going to do? We have our zone file. Remember the database I mentioned before? We have the zone file. So we sign this zone file. right? So we digitally sign this zone file. Uh, or in other words, we have resource records inside that. Um, uh, further, you know, we can create some resource record sets inside our zone. So what we can do is we can sign these resource record sets and create some signatures. And then these signatures can be verified by our public key. Uh, to do that, we have to publish our public keys. So that's where, uh, that's what we are going to do in, in uh, DNSSEC. Now going into details of how it works, how the validation works. Say for example, I am example.net, right? I am example.net. So if I want to protect my zone, as I mentioned you just now, I would sign my zone, I would sign my database, right? So after I sign my database, I will have several signatures associated to my resource records, I will have my public key published, and I will keep my private key safe, right? And then, um, so if someone um, want to validate my data, obviously my, only myself is not enough, right? So how can you trust myself? 
that trust cha- trust can be built based on the chain because if you can uh, get a certain uh, confirmation from my parent you know that's good so that means to do that i have to actually propagate my trust to my parent so in dns who is your parent your uh, you know your parent domain that who has delegated that zone for yourself so if i am example.net my parent would be .net if you talk about my parent parent's parent would be uh, the root right so that's how the hierarchy is so what we do is once i um, sign my zone i will propagate my trust right to my parent in the form of actually my public key i mean I, what i do is i send a hash of that uh, which is what we call the ds record or the delegation signer right so that's another resource record we use in dnssec so i send the the trust to my parent and then the parent can use that in the parent zone and can be signed by using parents keys as well so in the end actually parent will also have an associate signature for that ds record that i send to my parent right and then the parent will do the same parent will also have parents ds record and parent will send that to parents parent which is the root right all the way top of the hierarchy is root so root will also then have these uh, record in the root zone with the signatures so when always then the response comes back if you remember the response is first the root will tell where to go to the next level uh, so the recursive server can validate when the root will give that information it can check against the, it can check the signatures against those public keys and check whether we are going to the right place so that happens all the way across the hierarchy and then uh, so that the recursive server can finally validate we are going to the right place so that's the concept behind dnssec now the thing is that of course you know if you have to deploy this if you have to uh, implement dnssec you have to uh, have some planning you have to do some um, uh, you know you need to actually know collect facts about your networks uh, do some planning and and so on sometimes uh, a business case is also very important in this case uh, because if you have to convince your uh, top management say for example uh, you if you have to uh, uh, plan for this project plan for budgets and things like that uh, you you will have to prepare some business cases and so on so this is where uh, you you the dnssec is um uh, the the technology has been there for quite long i mean it's not just it's not something just started we are not talking about a test process here or we are not talking about something uh, just started it has been there for like almost 20 years so it is pretty well well, well established uh, security mechanism that has been well tested and uh, root zone has been signed uh, top level domains uh, about almost 90% of the tlds they have signed so it is a technology that has been used so these are also valid things uh, that you should include in your business cases when it comes to uh, preparing uh, for the deployment now some statistics Uh, that you might want to consider uh, here the first first uh, the bar that 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 shows the percentage of tlds signed in root and the second one is percentage of tlds signed so what's the difference between these two i can say for example i am a tld i am dotnet so i can sign my zone that's okay but if i don't send the ds records to the root that validation uh, cannot happen right so that trust is not there between those two so that is the difference between first and second so usually the difference is minimal most of the tlds who have signed they have sent the ds records to the root right and then the third one is where the second level domains so that is below .net or tld level so something .net example .net you know these type of second level domains so if you if you really see the statistics for that uh, it's pretty low it's like possibly about 5% or so so we have to do a lot of work there say for example when you when you think about your own uh, domain right or your own zone uh, that 
if you have not deployed DNSSEC, you are in that white space, right? It's about almost like 90, 95% or so. So we have to work quite a lot uh, worldwide uh, to make sure that second level domains are signed. Uh, equally, of course, you know, CCTLDs, TLDs, they also have another about 10% gap. If you talk, if you talk about CCTLDs, we still have about 50% CCTLDs uh, yet to sign. Uh, but overall, TLD, because most of the GTLDs they have signed in ICANN, the new, because ICANN has got agreements with the TLDs, but not with the CCTLDs, only with the T, T, uh, TLDs. So with the new agreements, uh, DNSSEC deployment is a requirement. So that is why you will see, uh, especially the new GTLDs and so on, um, have, uh, they have to sign, they have to deploy DNSSEC. Uh, so the numbers are pretty good at TLD level. But next level, second level, that's where we have to do a lot of improvement. Now, coming back to your side, the second level side, uh, so you, you will have to ask a question from yourself. Why uh, haven't we done that yet, right? Uh, why we couldn't do it yet? Is it because sometimes when we talk to engineers, we talk to network managers, uh, DNS, uh, DNS administrators, DNS um, uh, uh, people who are man managing their infrastructure, they say, okay, you know, we don't have enough uh, support staff who can take care of these. Uh, there are some overheads. Uh, yeah, so these are some things that you might want to include in your planning process as well, right? Uh, first of all, your technical staff need to be educated in this area. Uh, that is also why this kind of capacity building is important, right? These type of events, we try to do some more training, capacity building, so that you can, um, you, you can learn about these technologies. Some of the uh, engineers, uh, they are a little bit uh, worried. They have some fear, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt, whether, you know, whether this will work, uh, what will happen in case if I, f if I could not do it correctly. Uh, so some fear there. Um, and also sometimes when we talk to, say, registrars so ISPs, they would say that, uh, I mean, we don't want to, we haven't done that because our customers, our clients are not asking for it. But if you talk, go and talk to clients, they say, oh, you know, we, have, we don't care about it because our ISP is not offering, our registrar is not offering that service. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation as well. So uh, this is where actually we have to start somewhere, right? So where, uh, what should we do then? I mean, simple thing is that if you have to start deploying, uh, first of all, you know, try to do it in a test environment. That is the most important thing, right? So you learn the things, do it in a test environment. Uh, now, if you, when you want to go into production environment, again, you know, there are a few choices that you can think, think about. Um, obviously, you can do it manually, especially you know, if you have some uh, uh, small zone, maybe even at your starting, you can, you can test it on a manual basis, right? Uh, or when, um, if you have a bigger zone and, and if you are more experienced, if you know what's happening inside and, and so on, then you can go for some more uh, semi-automated or fully automated solutions. There are even uh, hardware uh, uh, modules um, or what we call HSMs, high, uh, hardware security modules, or even uh, DNS appliances that you can run the whole thing in, in box as well. So these are different uh, solutions available if you want to deploy DNSSEC in a production environment. But always you know, running in a test environment helps you at least to you know, get the things um, uh, where you can get uh, the initial knowledge, uh, you can learn the things, uh, you do it in a te test environment first. So what you can do simply, um, if you are a corporate, say for example, if you are a, a enterprise level company, corporate, even university and so on, uh, try to sign your domain names. I told you there are two aspects. One is the signing, right, in the authoritative servers, and then the other thing is the validation, right? So sign, if, you, if you are a corporate, if you manage your own DNS, try to start with that. Um, try to s switch on the validation. If you run your own recursive service, try to switch on the validation. It's not a big deal, right? So basically, um, your recursive service, your caching service, can then answer DNSSEC enable queries. Maybe second step, you can go for signing. First, you switch on the validation. Second step, you go for signing. And then, if you are a general user, 
maybe you are not using DNS or you are not actually um, running your own DNS. Maybe you are relying on someone else. If that's the case, you can ask them, can you turn on the validation for us? Because we want to, you know, we want to do DNS that can enable queries. That's something that you can always ask them. And generally, you know, try to get the use of uh, various, you know, capacity building opportunities, training, and so on that happens in these sort of uh, uh, events. Uh, ISOC offer a lot of resources in the ISOC website. Uh, I can uh, do the same, APNIC do the same. So many of these organizations, they have a lot of contents related to these technologies. So try to get the uh, maximum benefit of these um, contents. So I think uh, just wrapping up, it's something uh, that you have to think about, right? The NSSEC, uh, hopefully, um, during even this event in the next few days as well. You can go into more details as well. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to answer now. Does it affect the performance of the network? Uh, see, you, uh, yes, there are, there are, I mean, there are uh, solutions like that, right? There are, of course, commercial solutions. There are open source solutions as well. Um, you can, uh, you can try it out. Of course, you know, initially you can try out uh, uh, open solution first, right? In a test environment, try to do it in a test environment first. That's where you can get a better feel about the performance. From performance aspect, few things can happen. One is obviously, you know, when you when you sign, your zone files will increase, right? Because you will have signatures uh, in, in your zones, because your resource record sets would be signed. So that's where your zone, zone files can even increase like 10 times or so. So there can be some performance uh, issues, especially if you have large zones and so on. Uh, and then your name servers, uh, memory, right, the CPU power, all these things can uh, take into consider. I mean, ta you have to take into consideration, especially in terms of performance. So these, all these things can be done during testing phase, right? So you'll get a better idea. Uh, you can't really say this is the thing for everyone because depending on your zone size, depending on your environment, depending on your bandwidth, all these things can change. So it has to be, uh, you just have to test in your own environment, okay? Okay, and uh, second one, if I'm, if I'm a regular internet user, do I know if the ISP does provide DNSSEC or no? Sorry? Uh, if I'm a regular internet user, a customer, how can I find out that the ISP provides DNSSEC? Yeah, so you can uh, you can simply there are lots of plugins available, right? There are lots of plugins available. You can uh, use those, and um, I can give you some of those. You know, after the session, some links I can send you as well. Uh, also, actually, even even those websites I mentioned, there are lots of references uh, where you can check. Um, and also, there are various other tools. You know, you can do a dig, for example. You know, yeah. So there are tools that you can check on those. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, we. Thank you for a very good session. Uh, just a light question: What is the absoluteness of that security? The sense of security? I mean, how secure we are when we have deployed the DNS security, DNS stack with us? Okay. Is it a sort of a foolproof yeah. thing, or it, you can just, still be compromised? It's just, as I said before, uh, nowadays there are lots of these uh, phishing attacks and, and cash poisoning type attacks. These kind of things happen, right? So at least if you uh, if you have deployed DNSSEC, uh, of course, you know, if, from a deployment perspective, you know that your zone is safe, right? If someone is visiting your website or using your mail servers, you know, you, that the validation is there. I mean, you can validate that. Uh, and also, if you're providing validation, that means for your clients, say, for example, then you know that your client, when you provide that validation to your clients, even if your client is visiting other websites, not only your website, but also the other websites and so on, they get the, uh, you're giving, you're validating them, right? But also, you know, 
sometimes you also have to take some precautions as well. Say, for example, if your signatures expire, right? When you deploy DNSSEC and your signatures expire, it's a responsibility that you have to take. If your signatures expire, then uh, the validating resolvers will say uh, server fail because it cannot validate, right? So that's something, those are some overheads that you have to uh, take care and plan and uh, attend to, right? So it's not just, you can't just leave, once you sign, just you can't leave it and forget about that. You have to actually attend to that and make sure you're maintaining that properly. That is also why some, after some time some companies, they would go for some more automated solutions where because if you try to do that manually, that, that's a fair bit of work as well. Uh, manually do make sure all, you know, whenever the signatures expire, you have to resign. Uh, but if you have some automated solutions, then uh, it can take over those things. Yeah. As they say that criminal psychology is always one step ahead of what you plan. And uh, the locks only keeps honest people honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Thank you. That you already mentioned that publishing keys and the signature can increase the security. So uh, I think that also provides some option for the other side also that it can be fake also. The keys can be misused as well. Uh, I mean, how? So basically, say if I if my key, or, or say for example, if my private key is compromised, yeah, then of course there's a risk there. And, um, but if I keep my private key safe. The public key as well. No, public key doesn't matter, because in DNS, the data is public, right? We are not talking about confidentiality factor here. We are talking about the authenticity and the integrity of the data. Because in DNS, data is public. If you want to visit a website, you have to know the IP address to get, get there, right? So what we want to achieve here is whether it's the right one, whether are you going to the right place, so authenticity. That's what we want to achieve. So that's why we need public keys. So, so we have to publish our public keys. No, the publishing the public keys makes some sense that we are going to use them based on the signature as well. So these public keys cannot be used as fake public keys. No, but uh, the thing is there's always a relationship between the public key and the private key. Right? So that is why you have to keep the private key safe. So that's okay. That's right. uh, my question was uh, what kind of settings are required on the client end? What kind of? Settings. Uh, for example, if I want to use DNSSEC as a client, uh, what settings would be required? Okay. I think um, some of the uh, browsers, um, I mean, as I said before, there are plugins available so if uh, you know if you want you can uh, install those plugins in your browser so that always whenever you visit a website and so on uh, the browser will say for example it would give a green color key say for example like nowadays like in when you have SSL and so on you have a lock right padlock in the same way that will show you uh, that uh, website you know that that zone is signed um, I think you know some email clients browsers and so on they all they're coming with uh, already built-in uh, DNSSEC um, uh, validation, built-in, right? Uh, so, so these are the things that you'll have to, um, I mean, you, you'll, you'll have to check with the uh, software that you use, the browser that you use, the email uh, client that you use, whether it supports that. A small question, please. Uh, will it affect the response time also uh, for the client or between servers? Uh, yes, because performance uh, can be uh, can be a factor, right? As we discussed, and also um, and also the size, because sometimes because when you get a response, uh, a signed response, uh, obviously the packet size will increase. So which means um, even your firewall can block that, right? So you you need to make sure that. Uh, you know, those things are sorted out. Your firewall uh, will allow that and, uh, uh, and so on. And, and then, of course, uh, the response time as well. That, those things can affect because of the performance issues. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions, again, I'm happy to uh, answer during the tea break or, or the, the next few days. Thank you. Thank you.